Um, I start my presentation. I brought you a couple of slides. So that's uh, on the left hand side, you see the report that has just been published, um, including the title. Um, one second. Okay. So what I want to do is talk about why has digitalization not delivered on green growth on environmental sustainability so far. Then I explain the relation between digitalization and growth independence. And then I want to point out a, a four broad policies that would help to um, combine digitalization and growth independence. So I think we all know this, but I just want to put the whole discussion into perspective. This is um, this is the climate situation that we face at the moment. The red line, we see climate emissions have been rising in the past. The red line is then business as usual if we don't do anything. And the, the blue and gray, gray areas, those are the transitions to, uh, to stay within 1.5 degrees. And what is very clear is that that's a radical change. I want to leave it at that. I don't want to go into the numbers. Now, with this in mind, there's this debate on green growth versus degrowth and growth independence is somewhere in between, I would say. And I don't want to go into de detail on that either, and I don't do it in the report. There is this debate. It's still going on. I think what is clear from my perspective is that having this picture in front of us, it's clear that we need to do anything that that makes sense to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and if that includes reducing economic growth we should be able to do it and if that's the case then we should organize our societies and economies so that they work even if we reduce gdp gross domestic product and that's the idea of growth independence Now the question, has digitalization so far helped to achieve green growth and could it do so in the future? And this is just a very descriptive situation of what we have experienced over the past decades. So you see in the black, uh, the blue line is uh, GDP growth. Then the green line is uh, greenhouse uh, carbon emissions here, energy consumption, the red line. And then you see the different faces at the top of digitalization, just very broadly, computer and internet, mobile phone, smartphone. And what you see is, well, we have experienced digitalization, but still we have only, I mean, here it looks like decoupling, right? So we have experienced more growth than increase in carbon emissions, um, but nevertheless, uh, carbon emissions have still been increasing. So we have had no, what we call absolute decoupling. Why is that the case? Why has digitalization not lived up to its promises? And I think this is in the debate, it's always important to keep in mind. I mean, there are those promises still out there. I, I started working on digitalization around 10 years ago and they were there 10 years ago and then they are still there today um, that uh, promises are and, and hopes um, in policy discussions, in business discussions, um, that digitalization will be the game changer for sustainability with growth. Why has that not materialized so far? Um, in the report, we summarize four effects of digitalization, two positive and two negative ones. So on the left side, you see the beneficial effects that would help uh, how digitalization helps to achieve environmental sustainability. And one is efficiency. So the argument is we see more efficiency in industry, more efficiency in mobility, um, et cetera, et cetera. And the second one is substitution. So we substitute physical goods by digital services. What we do at the moment is I think the most prominent example, we have um, a video conference instead of traveling from, from somewhere to Brussels. Now, the point is that both have been much less than hoped for. The efficiency gains when you have, we have quite good data in, in industry, in industrial production, the, the use of digital technologies there has increased efficiency, but only a bit. Um, and when you look at substitution, the point is yet substitution, yes, substitution sometimes place, takes place. But actually, it's not substitution, but it comes, comes on top. So we do video conferences now, but we do not travel uh, less to the amount that we do video, video conferences. So since, since Corona or since after Corona, we actually start doing both again. So that's the left side. Um, beneficial effects smaller than hoped for. On the right hand side, you see the detrimental effect, environmental footprint, and I think that's obvious by now, 
um, in the debate, certainly, that the production of all the, the, the device that we have, smartphones, computers, uh, monitors, etc., it just takes up a lot of energy and resources. And I spared you the numbers. Um, if you want to know numbers, uh, we can uh, talk about it in the discussion. The second one is rebound and deduction effect. So it's not only the energy that we um, need for, uh, for all of these devices to produce them, but um, we use the devices to consume more. And again, the smartphone is, is the best example. We can buy anything from anywhere at any time. Um, when I wait for a bus, we can buy, I, I can buy anything on Amazon. And that's a typical, um, I would say, induction or rebound effect um, where digitalization brings about more consumption and thereby also more energy and resource consumption. So that's the explanation of why it has not delivered yet. And now the question is, what does that have to do with this growth debate and with growth independence in particular? So when we say um, we need the environmental transformation right now very drastically, and that might reduce economic growth. Um, and at the same time, we have digitalization. What does that do with um, growth dependencies? And two um, aspects of growth dependencies are always uh, discussed most. It's employment and the social welfare system. And I want to look at how digitalization uh, changes the picture here. So the argument is regarding employment, that employment and growth have been quite closely linked in the past. When economies grow more, we have less unemployment. So then the fear is that if we have this environmental transformation that brings about non-growing or even shrinking economies, and the unemployment might rise. The role of digital technologies here is that it um, makes the problem even bigger because digital technologies um, are at the moment used for increasing labor productivity. So they are not, uh, I would even say, not primarily used, let's say, in industrial production to reduce energy and resource consumption, but they are primarily being used to increase labor productivity so, so that we have, let's say, the, um, what, what, uh, the factories without any people in there, without any workers. That's not really the case, but it goes into that direction. Now comes a bit big but, and I think this argument is really important in the debate. When the transformation would be initiated that in the, to the extent that we need it, again, think about this uh, greenhouse gas emission reductions that I showed you in the first slide, that would change these relations. It would change the relation between economic growth and employment, and it would change the relation between digitalization, labor productivity, and um, and resource consumption. And to give you, I think, the most important example or aspect of that is that labor intensive production would be fostered within such a transformation. Um, so when you look at concept for, for environmental or socio-environmental transformations, um, more money, more public money would go into care work, um, a lot more uh, what going on in recycling and repairing compared to new, buying new products. And all of those activities are very labor intensive. So um, actually due to these changes, we would have, I would argue, less of a problem of unemployment, even if the transformation goes along with the reduction in GDP. And digitalization can be used for exactly these uh, aspects, in particular recycling and repairing. I come to that in a second. Um, so I would say regarding employment, actually, the, the major challenge is to master the transition from, from the jobs that we used to see to the jobs that we would see in a growth-independent um, economy. The second part of growth-independence uh, social welfare systems, um, again, what's the idea? So financing of social welfare systems is closely linked to economic growth at the moment, for example, because economic growth at least sometimes or uh, often goes along with increasing wages and um, social welfare systems are often linked to the to the uh, level of wages so then the fear is again when we don't when we don't have any gro uh, economic growth anymore as part of the environmental transformation financing these um, systems becomes more difficult the role of digitalization here is i think at least two aspects the first one is that, and, and David touched upon that, the first one is that there are a lot of precarious uh, jobs in the digital economy itself so that they 
uh, don't contribute to social insurance financing. And the second one is that we see an, a, a shift from wages towards capital income. So the, the capital owners earn more and the wage owners, uh, the, the, the wage earners um, earn less. And that again, makes it more difficult to finance those systems. Again, also like an employer, uh, at the example of employment, um, the initiation of a sustainability transformation is likely to change the situation. And then the question is, how is the sustainability transformation initiated? And um, what are the policies? And I come to that in the end. That's it regarding growth independence. The other aspect that we do in the report is that we combine it. And again, it closely links to what David said regarding sobriety. We call the digital sufficiency. Um, I think the difference is there, but it's small, I would argue. Again, we can discuss that. Um, in the report, I argue that digitalization can be used for sufficiency. And I want to give you a couple of examples here. Um, so digital substitution, I already said, video conferences can substitute travel, but then they actually need to substitute it and not come on top. Um, sharing, I think we know these examples. Um, can be facilitated by digitalization. Most prominent examples are car, is in the mobility sector, car sharing, bike sharing. Second hand, I think this is a big potential um, in the environmental transformation and in the potentials of digitalization because there are so many objects, in particular in our um, affluent European societies, you know, the cellars and attics are full of uh, objects and they can be reused. Many of them we can be re re reused. Um, repairing um, will need to become a bigger part of the economy in the environment in, in the sustainability in the sustainable future. And digitalization helps to bring about, you know, so that you get the information how to repair, um, guidelines, YouTube videos, you name it. And then the last one, presuming and subsist subsistence, they're the ideas that digitalization can help to produce goods uh, uh, regionally or even at home. And, and a prominent example are solar panels that are digitally connected in the in the energy grid and are a form of presuming. So presuming means you produce energy and you consume at the same time. That's what's, what the consumers are. Now, what are the policy um, areas and policy um, recommendations that we can draw from combining those two aspects, growth independence and sufficiency um, from the perspective of di digitalization. And I want to point out four very broad ones. Um, the first one is, again, and I, I, don't, I don't think we can, um, we can do without it in the environmental transformation to change the relative prices of resources and labor. And that's a, an old one, I would say, but for digitalization, nonetheless, um, as important as before, because only if, if we have different prices for, for resources, relative prices for resources and labor, so resources become natural resources uh, and emissions become more expensive and labor relatively cheaper, um, that doesn't mean that wages re are reduced. Um, that gives the intense incentives, for example, for businesses not to produce new goods, but to repair goods. Um, or for for business or for businesses to um, to develop that organize actually very efficient second hand market so that it becomes more convenient to buy and sell goods as a as a as an individual on the second hand market just to give two examples the second one is a very strong social welfare system and and this again comes back to my point on employment i think that the transition of jobs um, is is the real challenge. A lot of jobs will disappear in the if we succeed in the environmental transformation. A lot of jobs, for example, in recycling and repairing and in care work, etc., will will come up. And how do people get people retrained? Maybe it's at, at another location, etc. So I think here the the governments and the state have a very big role to play in guaranteeing a very so a very strong social welfare system. Then come sectoral policies, and I cannot go into detail here, but when you look at how digitalization can, can uh, be used for sufficiency in the different sectors, in, in agriculture, in mobility, in energy, in buildings, etc., it's always connected not only to relative prices and to a social welfare system, but to a lot of other detailed um, policies in each sector. 
And the, the fourth one is um, we need different digital actors. Um, so the first three have been, you know, um, framework conditions, policy conditions. The fourth one is the question, who develops the digital technologies and with what purpose? And so far, it has been global companies with a perfect with the purpose of profit maximization. And I think that has to change so that there are actors who actually have sustainability in mind. And I think these can be public actors, but only, but also private actors like uh, cooperatives or foundations. Thank you.